Okay, so we are fall 2016 typography class and we're going to cover page 112 of our type book which covers para uh, project 4 paragraph indicators and um, so I'm going to create a new InDesign document on this one and this one's going to be five pages uh, of, of uh, different designs. So when uh, the document window comes open, I'm going to have to go to file a new for this one on my computer. Um, I am going to turn off facing pages. This is not a book. And uh, if you want to see what it's doing, the preview button on mine is selected. So if you check preview, you'll see that in the InDesign document, you'll see it's corresponding to whatever measurements we're putting in here. This will be um, 10 inches by 10 inches, which is the same thing as 60 pica by 60 pica. Seems like that's the same thing we did on our last project. I am not so much worried about splitting this up into columns. This is more of a freestyle sort of design. So on a number of columns, I'm not too worried about that. And for margins, the default uh, 3 pica, which is a half an inch, this will work fine as well. Um, however, if you did want to bleed some stuff off the edge, uh, in this case, most of the time we won't, but you guys might get a little crazy with it, on the, especially the last one. So set your bleed at P9. This is assuming that you might have anything going outside the edge of the page, which for body copy we don't normally <laughs> run off the page, but you'll see later in the fifth one that we are going to get kind of funky with it. So we're going to hit OK. Oh, and before we even uh, hit OK, Right now I only have one page in the Pages panel. I can tell it I need five pages in this field near the top. Uh, it's the third item down, five pages. And it will automatically set up five pages in my Pages panel. That way I don't have to create new pages. So it does it for me. So I'm going to hit OK. Expand this out a little bit. There we go. So I have five pages. Um, now, I want to tell you, my video is not going to necessarily correspond perfectly with what's in the book. Um, and if you're following along, here's, here's the bad thing. I did not type in Microsoft Word the copy that is found on page 75 of the book, which it suggests that we could use the copy from page 75. So I'm already kind of uh, behind the eight ball here. So what I'm, it also says you could use copy of your choosing. Hmm. So I'm going to go to the internet and find some. Um, let's see. What do I want to learn out today? I'm going to learn about the monarch butterfly because I'm still raising one. All I need is at least something with five paragraphs. So I'm going to go to, uh, why not? This, let's see what this is here. Um, let's go to monarchbutterfly.com. I bet they have some copy in here that I can steal. Oh, look at this. Look at all this copy. Now, I have to be careful because um, this is broken up. But I'm going to go into Word, and I'm going to copy and paste this into a Word document. I need to bring that monarch. I actually do have a monarch butterfly. The ones that I brought in were teddy bear looking ones. They were sphinx moths, and I had misidentified. I forgot to tell you guys. So I threw them in the backyard. And yeah, so John Perez, he also, his died. So um, it was no big loss there because Sphinx moths are not endangered. They're, they're doing fine. Um, so yeah, but I do have a monarch caterpillar because of the milkweed I collected. Um, it had a little egg on there and I, it was a little tiny yellow dot. And I was like, I think that's a monarch caterpillar egg. So I took that leaf off and I put it in a little container and it has hatched out and it's really cool. So I'll have to show you the pictures. So I'm just grabbing some, some stuff from the uh, internet here, a little story about monarchs and um, grabbing quite a few paragraphs from this. So I'm stealing. So whoever wrote this article on the monarch butterfly, thank you very much, I'm stealing your copy. It's just for an exercise. My things are kind of broken up a little bit so I'm having to clean it up. Um, when you're stealing from the internet like this, make sure you're, it's not putting in, um, like in here it's putting see more at this monarchbutterfly.com site. So I'm having to clean this copy up a little bit. And it also uh, will sometimes come in with um, some formatting when you get rid of some of that formatting, like double spacing between um, paragraphs, that kind of thing. Sometimes I supply you copy, and most of the time I don't, actually. 
Now, once I have all this copy select or copy in here, I'm going to save it. You can do whatever copy you want. If you want me to give you the butterfly copy just for practice today, that's fine. I could do that. Um, what is this? Okay. Let's get this thing settled here. But what you'll see, uh, oh, we got to get rid of this hyperlink again, or this see more at this website. What I want to do is I want to kill off any formatting here in Microsoft Word. So I'm going to select all my text. Make sure I don't have any extra returns at the end of my story, too. Uh, select all my text, and um, I can clear formatting by clicking on this. And I'm in Microsoft Word. I'm clicking on the Styles panel, and I get a panel that comes out here like this. And I can hit Clear Formatting. And it gets rid of any uh, extra formatting that might give me problems later, like extra spaces out of the, after the paragraph, uh, any hyperlinks that are built in there. I don't want those. So I uh, brought up the Styles panel in Word, and just after I selected all the text, hit Clear Formatting on my Apply Style. Um, if you get copy from your clients, they always want to dress things up and make them look really pretty, but when you go to place it in InDesign, it's a hot mess because they've used the space bar to space everything instead of tabs. It's just a mess. So I always clear all the formatting uh, when somebody gives me a Word document. So do you guys want me to share this with you, the butterflies? Can we just stop for a minute? Yeah. So you're getting copy right now. Yeah. Okay. Because I didn't know what you were No problem. Yeah, if you want to follow along, you can go get yourself some copy right now. Not a problem. I wonder if I can pause this. Say what? Oh, I can share it on Blackboard if you want mine. Sure. I have no problem doing that. Let me go to my week four stuff. And if you want to use this copy, you're more than welcome to. Okay, so if you want to use my copy, you're more than welcome to. I have now in week four in the project four folder. There's an attached file that says monarchbutterflies.docx, okay? So if you want to deal with that copy, you may have that copy. If you want to get your own, you can get your own. If you want to see, I will show you. Good heavens. Yeah, about five paragraphs or so, yeah. This monarch is really cute. I'll show it to you. Let's see if I can find it. Do, 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 do. Well, this might take more than what I have time to deal with. So I'll show you the butterfly later. Or the caterpillar. He is so cute. He's he's just adorable. How are we doing, Kisa? Um, can you show the style? Yes, how do you kill all these styles? So yeah. First of all, select all your type. And then up here in your control panel, there's a paragraph Styles, it says Styles Pane actually. It has a little backwards P in a circle. Click on that little guy and then click on Clear Formatting. It's the topmost uh, style that you want to apply if you've uh, taken text from the internet. Always, if you guys are taking text from the internet for any graphics project, maybe uh, you're in maybe another class you're doing some sort of really cool book and you don't have to write the copy and you're taking it from the internet, make sure you always clear that formatting after you take it because it just does crazy things. And then save it. All right, are we ready to move on? Shall we? Okay. So I'm on my first page, page one, and I am going to go to File and Place, and I'm going to get that copy because uh, that's what we're using here. So let me find my butterfly, Monarch Butterfly copy. You may have to download it. Now it'll tell you possibly the fonts are missing because in Microsoft Word it defaults to uh, Calibri, but I'm just going to hit close and my cursor will open. It'll be loaded anyway. It just doesn't have that font. And I'm just going to simply click in the upper left hand corner. It's going to load this text. Now it doesn't necessarily tell us what fonts to use. It just says using a series of paragraphs, either text of your own choosing or that found on 70, page 75. 
create variations that treat the delineation between paragraphs differently. What that means is we want to make sure that you can tell where one paragraph ends and the next one begins as far as delineation goes. We're going to create five alternative ways of introducing new paragraphs ranging from conservative to outrageous. In the last case, which will be page five, readability uh, is not a criterion. Study the results weighing the trade-off between the traditional approaches and those that are more exploratory and consider how the various solutions affect readability. So we're actually going to hang these up on Wednesday, Thursday and we're going to kind of compare and contrast which ones we think are really, really awesome which ones we and readable, which ones are awesome but not readable, and which ones are like, you know, I probably wouldn't set it like this again, but it's kind of cool. Um, so we're going to set this in various ways. So that being said, you can choose whatever font you want, assuming it's not a display uh, font. Display fonts usually are um, set, they're made for headlines and things. They're usually kind of ornate. So we're going to kind of keep it simple. You can choose whatever font you wish. Just keep in mind, yours will not look like mine because you might use a different font. So you can load fonts too if you wanted to. Um, and you want to keep it with something pretty readable. I suppose we could go with a Garamond or a Bodoni or a Baskerville. Uh, but I'm just going to kind of look around and see. We don't have a lot of fonts loaded. Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get boring on you guys. I'm just going to use Adobe Garamond Pro. You don't have to, but that's what I'm using. And uh, you'll notice that Garamond Pro uh, it looks smaller than maybe some other typefaces. So it's got a small X height. All right. So I'm going to save this as Project 4, actually my name, Project 4. Um, as we always do. So let me take it into my typography class, create a new folder, and name that as well. Always organize your stuff. So create a folder and save it. You can do that all in the same window. All right, so on page 113, it shows a variety of, exa of examples on how to set paragraphs. Um, I'm going to show you some basics of paragraph formatting in InDesign first before we get too crazy on some of the cool things they got on page 113. Um, so let's start out simple. First, I'm going to select all my paragraphs, and we're going to talk about how to set a paragraph indent for the first line. It's called a first line indent. Now, since this is paragraph formatting, instead of the little A selected, which is character formatting controls, we want the paragraph formatting controls, which is this little backwards P in the control panel in the upper left-hand corner. So click on the backwards P. Um, if you wanted it, you could set it justified, flush left, ragged right. You could play around with different settings. So that's one way of you know exploring this. But we wanted to talk first about um, this little area right here. I've got my cursor floating over um, a little image. It's got a little arrow pointing to the first line, and this is these little lines are indica indications of a paragraph. This is my first line indent. If I start clicking on the arrow that goes up, you will see that I start to get an indent into each paragraph. Okay, no longer do we hit the tab key to move the first line of the paragraph over. Okay, that's not proper proper technique. Okay, so this is first line ended. That's one way to indicate where one paragraph ends and the next one begins. Now, it's not all that exciting. They don't even have this one in the book because it's so boring, but I want to share with you how to do that. Uh, before we had that, I'm going to put this back at zero. Before we knew to use that, many of us as, as uh, you know, non-students of typography, we would put our cursor before the first letter of the paragraph when we had the tab key, which is actually incorrect. So we just do it this way. And it goes a lot quicker, too. Usually the measurement that you want between um, the be beginning of the uh, left edge and the beginning of the first word is what is called a 1M space. And think of it about as wide as the space of the uppercase M. But it's spelled E-M, one M, an M space or M quad. So in this case, this is the space right here is maybe a little greater than the width of this M, and that's okay. But you want it somewhere around the, the width of a capital M or a capital W, a big chunky letter. So that's one in, way to indicate paragraphs. 
I've zoomed out and I've selected all the text again. Here's another way which I use quite a bit because I actually don't like first line indents. It's my personal preference. Um, that's just, you know, you can like them. It doesn't, don't, don't not do first line indents because I don't do them, okay? Depends on what I'm doing. If I'm doing a, a novel or something, then I do first line indents because I want to save space. But for graphic design, when I'm, you know, have a little space to work with, I'm going to set my first line indent at zero for now. I'm going to show you um, how to set the space between the paragraphs. Um, now, many of us have thought of a, if somebody says, oh, I want a double space between my paragraphs, people will put their cursor at the end of a paragraph and hit return, and that's actually incorrect. This is what you did before you took typography class, is you hit return. Mm -mm, we don't do that. Mm -mm. In fact, if I find that in your stuff, I actually mark it down. So here's what we're going to do. If you want extra space after your paragraph, you're going to set it using the paragraph control panel. There's a little picture. Uh, I'm hovering over it right now. Whoops, not that one. This one. And it has a little arrow at the bottom of what appears to be a little paragraph and then a little white kind of space. I'm going to push the arrow up and you will see that I'm getting spaces between my paragraphs. I don't have to hit the return key. And sometimes it's hard to see where one paragraph starts and another one begins. So this will find all the paragraphs for you and do it. Now, typically what we do in this case, let me figure out what my point size and letting is. My point size is 12. I'm going to make my letting not auto. I don't like auto letting. Maybe my letting is 15. Typically what I do for a full space between them is if the uh, letting number is set at 15, then I set my space after it at 0. Uh, P15. That means zero pika is 15 points, and it'll convert it to one uh, one pika three points. Uh, but I just put the same number in there as my letting, and it is absolutely 100% this a full return between, or what appears to be a full return between my paragraphs. Um, usually, I do set it as the same number as the letting amount, and the reason why. Let me show you. The reason why I do that is if I had two columns of type, and you do not have to follow along on this, um, but if I had two columns of type, if I set it the same amount as my letting, then my copy across columns lines up beautifully. So it, it consistently lines up. So if I pull a guide down here, the base lines line up perfectly no matter where it is. That's because the space after uh, that I set was the same amount as the letting. Now, if I did not use that letting amount, I'll show you what happens. Maybe I just decided to make it one pica. They will not line up across the columns. This, they will not close line. And when I pull a guide down, in this case they are, so let me try a, try a different number. I was lucky that time. Uh, let's say a P9. Like, uh, yep, they don't line up now. So my, I have it under flyaway and feeding flowers and all that. Well, that does not line up to what's going on over here. So my text is not closed lined. So if this was in my portfolio and professionals looked at it, they'd be going, mm, you got to work on your typography. You need to close line your text. Oh, and I'm like, I don't know what they mean by that. I don't, that means line it up, line the baselines across the columns. So typically, again, to solve that problem, I will use a number that is equal to the amount of the letting, and they will line up perfectly across the columns. Good to know. All right. Now, you guys don't have to do this two-column business. I was just showing you. I like When I explain something, I like to share with you why I tell you you should do it a certain way. Okay, so space after column is one another way to indicate paragraph, um, paragraph uh, where one starts and the other one. Now, these are not the super creative ways that are in the book, uh, but I certainly did want to share with you some automated features of how to uh, indicate where a paragraph stops and starts. Now, in the book, let me take off my space between paragraphs. Yes? So if you don't push the return after the end of the paragraph, how does it know that that's the end of the paragraph? Uh, you're saying that here or in at the very end of the story or... In the middle of the story, you have okay. like different paragraphs. Well, the question is, how does this know where the beginning and end of a paragraph starts and stops if you haven't, if, like, let's say I haven't set any paragraph indications yet? Well, if I turn on my hidden characters, which is under Type, Show Hidden Characters, it will show that 
a backwards P at the end of a paragraph. So it knows that somebody hit return one time just to get to the next paragraph. Because you hit return one time just to get to the next paragraph, but some people hit twice to get that extra space, so we don't oh, have to do that okay. anymore. Oh, no, we still want, yeah, yeah, we definitely want one return between paragraphs, but we don't want to hit a double return to get that extra space. I'm sorry I was confusing you. Yeah, one return is definitely necessary to get to the next paragraph, but this, where I just hit the return key to get the space after, that's not proper. Thank you for asking for clarity on that. And sometimes it is hard to tell where one paragraph starts and the other one stops. Like, I would have never known that there was a paragraph that ended here, because it looks like it's just one big long paragraph. So that's the cool thing about I don't have to go hen pecking through and finding the ends and beginnings of paragraphs, it does it for me. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and put a little bit of a uh, first line in it so I can tell what paragraph, oops, wrong one, what paragraph starts where. I might change that later. Okay, now the things in the book, um, this project, it's like, it can get pretty exciting, but it can also get a little tedious. Uh, some of it can be pretty boring, though. The examples in the book, I, I don't necessarily want to see exact duplicates of what's in the book, because it just kind of, I'd like to see what you think and how you attack something. Um, but I'm going to show you some of the ways that they dealt with what they have in the book, so you know. And then I'll share with you things that are more uh, funky and advanced. But for instance, um, what they did to indicate the first paragraph is they did not do a first line indent uh, like I have. I should close that out. Um, what they did is they took the first word and they just made that first word bold. Um, now, in the depending on what font you're using, that may or may not be real apparent. I also might choose to make that a different color. So my first word is bold and possibly uh, a different color. Now what they did is they continued to do this and they had them run on and on and on. So I'm going to do it bold again and I'm going to make it um, red. And same thing with this in, in in February, bold and red. Now there's no automation here, I wish. Here I have to highlight each and every single word, make it bold and, bold and red. Unfortunately, I can't hold down the shift key and grab multiple words. It, it doesn't work that way in this uh, software. Okay, so each of these was bold. The first uh, word of every paragraph is bold. And then they took off. They didn't have any spacing uh, at the beginning of the paragraph. And then what they did is they deleted the actual um, paragraph return. And they had it something, they had something running along the lines of this. Now, it's a little long on the width. Nobody's going to read that, so I might shorten it up just so I can have people's eyes rest a little bit. And they also set it justified to kind of get it nice and squared in there. They're like, okay, call it a day. I just set paragraphs, and they're looking like, you know, you know where one starts and the other one stops. However, I forgot to turn off my hyphens. So is this what we need to be doing right now? No, you don't have to do it this way. It's just one option, and it's already in the book, so it's like, I'm just kind of sharing with you a variety. You do not have to do it this way. In fact, I encourage you guys to think of new ways. I would just follow along with you. You may if you exactly. want. It's the, if, if you want to follow again. along, that's fine just to practice. But yeah, I, I'm not looking forward to seeing 20 of the same solution to the same problem that's also in the book. I, I want to see you guys push it a little bit. Um, but I'm just kind of sharing with you how they did that. Um, so there, this technically is considered in design thinks of this as one continual paragraph because when I turn on my invisibles there's no backwards P's anywhere except for at the end. But I have done my own little thing here by making the first word of every paragraph bold and red. So clearly that's an indication where one paragraph stops and the other one begins. Now this is not a conventional setting. And that's what that's kind of the cool thing about this. They're not really looking for conventional settings. You know the first line indent, pretty conventional setting. The uh, space after the paragraph, pretty conventional setting. But in the book here, they're not showing much of anything conventional. Okay. And what I should have done, I should have copied and pasted that. So let's say this is my first solution to the problem. Um, also, you know what's really fun? I'm going to go to the end of this paragraph. Maybe this is the end of the story. 
There are little flourishes and florons and glyphs that are in different uh, fonts. You can put like end of story little little uh, mark, which I think is really sexy. I, I love I love when I'm reading a story or the end of a chapter and somebody, and especially in a novel that's super boring, I mean, it's all in your imagination, there's no pictures and you're reading. At the end, somebody puts this beautiful little typographic tidbit. I'm like, oh, thank you so much. I, it's just really pretty. So I might put an ending paragraph mark at the very end of this. I might do it on every uh, paragraph if, if I'm playing around with variation here. But um, how we get those is we go to type and we go to glyphs. And this particular font comes with um, different glyphs than maybe another font. So I'm like, ooh, that's pretty, or this clover leaf is pretty, or this is pretty. Um, some of them don't have pretties in there. And if that's the case, you may have to change the font you're using, at least for that little ending mark. So let's say I have that as my ending mark. It's this gorgeous little flourish, typographic fluoron. So there it is, like end of story. Now, if I really wanted to, I could even hit the return key and have that guy be at the end and then center him. Ooh, that's even more sexy. That tells me end of story. So these flourishes, you don't want to overdo it, but they're great little touches that say, hey, there's no more to the story. This is the end. Um, I, I love them. I, I, anything typographic that I can church up a little bit, I, I tend to do, so I, I, I've, um, kind of fallen in love with some of the dingbats and flourishes. How do I do it? Let me do that again. I will go to the end of my paragraph. Are you talking how do I get it or how did I center it? Okay, I put my cursor at the end of a paragraph. I went to type and glyphs and I expanded out my glyphs panel for this font and not all fonts have the same glyphs. I'm just looking for something kind of cool and groovy to put at the end. And in mine, I happen to find this gorgeous little flower. And I just double click on it. And when you double click on it, it automatically will put it in where your cursor is, assuming you had your cursor sitting there blinking. Now, if your cursor's not there blinking, then you can't add it very easily. It has to be, you know, the type tool has to be selected and your cursor has to be inside the text. It's pretty cool stuff. I'm in Garamond, but. Oh my gosh, there's so many cool glyphs. Oh, I'm going to highlight this. In fact, sometimes I create another line down below like this, and I go and I search for all these glyphs. I'm going to put my cursor here. I'm going to make this different font. Let's see, webdings and wingdings, there's all sorts of glyphs um, if we have them loaded. Okay, so we have wingdings right here. We have wingdings 2, wingdings 3. There's all sorts of wingdings. There's zaf ding bats, and Herman Zaf did beautiful things, so I'm going to click on zaf ding bats. And the thing about Zaf Dingbats, when I go to the glyphs panel, they're all glyphs. So even the A, you know, the, the, the letter A is a glyph, uh, the letter B is a glyph, and so on. So I have all these beautiful wingdings and webdings and dingbats. Ooh, I love the little finger that points, the pointer finger. Um, there's just a lot of really cool things in, in this. And uh, maybe I like a star, maybe I like a, you know, whatever. There's a snowflake. Oh, I like a snowflake. That'd be a nice ending. Actually, it's about a butterfly. I should choose something that's butterfly related. Probably that plant was nice. It's too bad I'm a milkweed. Something maybe organic. But the, I keep clicking on They keep adding. I'm like, oh, okay. Well, I don't want all of those. So let me um, just highlight the one I do want. Delete the rest of them. I could even make this bigger if I want to. Sweet. Oh my god, he's invading the text. This problem, this is a problem with the letting. I just have to make the letting bigger. So maybe I want to make my flourish big and show that that's the end of the paragraph. That's a little large, but isn't that lovely? It's just lovely. It's a little too large, though. But this is a Zaf Dingbat mixed with the font Garamond. And they mix beautifully. So oftentimes these web dings and wing dings are, um, you know, you got to, Make sure it goes well with the type. I might even put one up at the top. Oh, that's lovely. Now, these are just extras. You don't have, you know, this is more about where one paragraph starts and the other one stops. So these are just extra things. Now, I have known people to separate the paragraphs with those as well. So if they had a run on like this, um, let me make this the same size. This is 28 points. I'm going to make it 12. But if they had this, this continuous run on of this paragraph and maybe they did not use the um, red type or the bold they might put in a um, little glyph 
at the end of the paragraph, let me make sure my flooding and everything's the same. And this uh, can make an, it can be an indication that one paragraph just ended and the next one begins. Um, however, I don't really want it to rest out there. So this says, hey, end a paragraph, and I can do that throughout the whole entire story. So that's another way that people do it is they just put a little mark that's like, it doesn't have to be this little flourish thing, um, but something that just indicates this is the end of the paragraph. Also, you can make a note, even if it's just something as simple as a bullet point. So I highlight that, I hit option eight. Um, hope that font doesn't have it. Try it again in this font. So Garamond has this little circular mark. That could be a paragraph indicator where one ends and the next one begins. So there's a number of ways you can handle this, and I would do it with every paragraph. So that little, that I only know that keyboard shortcut because I use a lot, but it's in the glyphs panel. So if I went to type and glyphs, that little dot is in the glyphs panel. So that's a pretty calm way of indicating where one paragraph starts and the other one begins. Um, let me get rid of that. Now what I should be doing is I should create a new page each time I do this, but uh, I'm, I'm, so let's say I've got this one. I'm gonna go to the next page and I'm going to paste, copy and paste from one page your text to the next. And I probably should have done this before I took my paragraph uh, marks out. So let me hit the return key between each paragraph again. I should just have some pretty dull text here for my next one. I'm going to make everything the same uh, font and the same color. Get back to normal. Okay. Now, in the book, it shows the, some crisscrossing of paragraphs. Maybe you want to separate paragraphs. And here's, this one is uh, really important. You need this a lot when you're working with multiple columns. So let's say I wanted this paragraph to be, um, my paragraphs to be somewhat more narrow like this. But I want my paragraphs to be separated into their own boxes. We don't copy and paste them into their own boxes typically, um, not in publications. So here's how we get paragraphs to flow from one box to the next without copying and pasting. So I'm going to pull up on the bottom anchor point all the way up to that first paragraph. That was the first paragraph. It was a very short one. And you'll see that there is a red plus sign when I did that. It's going, hey, there's more to your story. It's just not showing. So I'm going to click on that red plus sign, and I'm going to draw another text box. Then I'm going to shorten that one. Then I still have the red plus sign. I'm going to click on it again. I'm going to draw another text box. And I'm going to shorten or increase that one to accommodate that paragraph. I'm going to do it again until I run out of paragraphs. So that's a big paragraph. Oh, I don't know where that paragraph stops and starts. Oh, oh my gosh, it was a short paragraph. There we go. Got to know where your paragraphs end and begin. Cool if I had my invisibles on or hidden characters. But it will flow from one to the next sure that is one long paragraph but I have to click on the little red box a red plus sign but this is another way where I'm like you know what here's one where one paragraph starts and the other one begins I might be cognizant of how things align to one another just to create a nice sense of unity so these are aligning to one another I'm trying not to be sloppy too horribly sloppy Cool, a little green line pops up when it's aligned. So these the these on the right are aligned to one another, at least on their left-hand side, and these on the left are aligned to each other on the left-hand side. So this is another way to indicate paragraphs. It looks like I have six paragraphs, by the way. I, I said uh, get something with five paragraphs, but this has six, and we'll live with it. But this would probably need to be moved up and maybe over a little bit just because of the way composition and space work. And this is maybe another way for me to indicate um, where one paragraph ends and the next one begins. It looks pretty cool. It's not boring compared to maybe um, some other way to set type. So I just got to work with work my spacing out a little bit nicer. 
I think people would be more apt to be uh, interested in reading something like this, assuming they can read it in the right order, than maybe something that's a little bit more boringly set up. Especially if we're not, you know, we don't do, normally do this in uh, novels, but we might do it in some designer book. So there is maybe a second attempt at indicating paragraphs. Oops. Why that didn't come under right? Very interesting. So in each of those boxes, is all of the words technically still in that box? You just were yep. doing a snapshot of. Yeah, each so box much. has every word of that paragraph in there. And here's the deal: if I were to increase the size of this box, it will reflow the next ones because it's like, oh, it, these are all—it's called an uh, auto flow. So these are all flowing together automatically. So if you do increase the size of a box, it will, since the box is bigger, it'll say, oh, you want some more text to go up in there for the next paragraph. So you have to be careful of that. Um, so I'm going to squeeze that out so it goes back to where it's supposed to, supposed to go. But yeah, it's, uh, some people have a hard time, uh, whoops, getting used to that. The whole, oh my gosh, everything's flowing and it's reflowing because the paragraph is uh, all whacked out. I got everything all whacked out now. Now, um, I'm going to go back to my original copy. I'm on a third page already. Um, and now I'm going to indicate another way to, I'm going to do something again graphically to indicate where one paragraph starts and the other one begins. Um, so my first one was what kind of what they had in the book, which, you know, that's kind of a cop out, but um, just kind of showing you some options. This one is not necessarily exactly like it is in the book, so I'm just moving paragraphs, or, or moving different paragraphs around. Um, but then there's the funky stuff that you guys really are interested in. Like uh, on page 113, they have type at the end of a paragraph. It starts to come loose of the paragraph and it looks like string. So I'm going to show you how to put type on a path, which is really cool. And then at the bottom lower right corner, or excuse me, lower left corner, it shows type inside of shapes. So I'm going to share with you some of the um, things there as well. Now I'm going to move my type off to the side for just a second. And let's say I wanted to have my type um, follow along some sort of wavy path. Well, first I have to dry, draw that wavy path. You could use a pencil tool. I'm not real fond of it because I don't have a tablet up here. I'm using my mouse. So I have limited control over what I'm doing here. Doesn't look all that smooth. Um, if you wanted to, double click on your pencil tool and increase the smoothness before you draw. Um, there's no preview or anything because I don't have anything selected and there's no preview anyway. So I'm going to adjust the smoothness to say I don't know, 48. I don't know what I'm doing yet. We'll see when I draw. Now when I draw with the pencil tool, when I do my curves, it will smooth them out. It won't have as many anchor points. Um, again, if I don't like that that's not super smooth, I might increase the smoothness a little bit more. Again, I have to delete that to do that. So, uh oh, the door locked all by itself. Oh. So when, ah, so when you use the pencil tool, you want to have it smooth and This is one way we might draw a path. I personally like the pen tool because I have a lot more control over it, but most of you guys, if you're not used to using it, you don't have a love for that tool. Um, so, but I am going to use the pen tool because I like the way it makes my stuff um, because I can control my anchor points and I can control the curve. Now, when I use the pen tool, people are like, oh, that looks easy. And then you try it, and you're like, that wasn't easy at all. How did you do that? So the pen tool is, is for a lot of people, not a real friendly tool. Um, I'm just clicking and dragging um, to create this wave. Oops. Getting a little too click happy here. So I have this beautiful wave. And I'm going to have my type go along that wave. And in fact, I'm going to copy and paste this wave many, 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 many times because maybe I want my whole entire paragraph 
to be on this wave. So I'm going to alt drag it down and if I hold down the shift key it will keep it in line. Uh, I could also move it um, for a second. I don't want to drag it too short. I want to make sure that I type fits on there. So let's say this almost looks like a music thing, doesn't it? So let's say I want type on each line. Now the one thing I want to do too is turn the line actually off because the type will become the line. So I have all of these lines I've drawn, one, and copied it. And I have to tell these lines that they're going to receive type. So I click on the lines. I think I, I, think I have to do this one at a time, according to what I remember. And I, hold, I click and hold on the type tool. Click and hold down with your mouse, and you will see you have a type on path tool option. So click and hold type on path tool. Then what I do is I have to tell each line you're going to receive type, so I have to click on each line with the type on path tool. So I only clicked on one line so far, and you'll see that there's a cursor. In fact, if I start typing, you'll see that that type goes right along that line. That's pretty groovy. But that's not the type I want. I want this type down here. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to move down to the next line I drew, and when I do, there's a little plus sign that pops up next to the type on line tool. That means, hey, you've hit it. You're on it. Go ahead and click. And it turns the second line into one that will receive text. And I do that to the third line, and the fourth line, and the fifth line. Okay. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to my text. I'm going to select all of this text. I hit Command A to select all. I'm going to copy it, which is Command C on a Mac, Control C on a PC. So I've copied it after I've select all. Now I go back to the first line that I drew, and I'm still on my Type on Path tool selected. And you'll see that the, there's a little curve in that tool until I float over that line. That means, hey, if you click here now, you'll get it. Click. And I'm going to paste. Edit, paste, or Command-V. And there is part of my copy for the Monarch Butterfly. Now, where's the rest? Well, let me grab the black arrow tool, also known as the selection tool, and you'll see there is the plus sign at the end of that line of type. Well, if I click on that plus sign, then link it up to the next line, it will automatically flow the next line. So I'm going to click on the plus sign, and I'm going to click on the next line, and it goes there. Now the next line has the plus sign. I'm going to click on the red plus sign and flow it to the third line and so on. You want to make sure you wait till you get the little um, chain link. If it's not chain link then you click it will create a text box out there by itself. So you want to make sure when the chain link comes up you click on that next line and go to the end of the uh, line type and do it some more. Very nice. Now I would certainly turn off the underline on this because it's about the type creating the line not the underline. So I can tell my stroke weight to be zero. That's up in the control panel. Uh, you'll see the square hollow uh, object. And then you'll see one PT. That's how thick the stroke is. Make that zero. And you will see that the type is making the beautiful lines, not the lines. It, it, it's, it's much less invasive. It looks better. You shouldn't have underlying type. Say again? How did you prepare the line to happen? How did I prepare the line so it would receive type? So you have a line drawn, right? I'm going to draw a sloppy line here. And you want to prepare it to receive type by clicking and holding on the type tool and choosing the type on path tool, which is the one with a little the type. The T is kind of diagonal. And when you float your cursor over the beginning of that line, you will see a plus sign. When you see the plus sign, that means you know, it's good to click. You click, and it's ready to receive text. I just pasted it in there. Now you might be wondering, why didn't I just copy and paste line by line 
And why did I worry about linking these up? Well, what if I change something in here? What if I decide that my font should be a different font altogether? Maybe I want that to be Helvetica. Well, Helvetica takes up less space. And it's going to ref or more space rather, and it's going to reflow perfectly. So Garamond only took up two lines of type for the paragraph. Helvetica is taking up three. I have a horrible widow right there. Uh, bad widow. What do we do with widows? Kill, it. kill them. How do we kill them? With fire. <laughs> uh, no. Good idea though. How do we kill the widows? I need to adjust the space, the, the word spacing. So I may have to click and drag down here and go out to my um, my flyout menu and go to justification. I may have to take my word spacing down just a little bit. So um, to kill that. Uh huh. I always say, kill your widows and orphans minus one. Yep. Uh huh. For each one, you get minus one. Yes, yes, ma'am. I am so mean like that. So when Alan Lewis says I'm mean, that's what he means. Boy, that's really, this is really hard. I guess I can, I gotta, I'm going down here. Let me try minus five on my letter space. I'm going to have to, oh, there we go. Whew, I had to adjust my word spacing and my letter spacing on this one to get it to work. But you can see, though, that, you know, if I change the font or change the point size, maybe I decided I want this to go down a little bit. Um... You want that text to reflow automatically. You don't want to have to recopy and repaste stuff over and over again. Next question. Um, the square plus yes. Um, the first one. Okay. If you have a square with a plus sign, I'm going to draw one more line here. It doesn't matter if you're on the first line or any line. So if you have a plus sign with a square, you click on that plus sign and you go to the next line, assuming that line has been turned into a type on path line. Let me make sure that is. Um, but you click on that plus sign, and you go to that next line that is uh, type on path, and you click on it, and it will automatically flow to the next line. But when I click on the next one, does it happen? When you click on the little pl plus sign, are you getting you're getting a loaded cursor like this? Yeah. No. Oh, maybe you're not. You're certainly not at the end of your story. Okay, let me come back and look. You're at the end of the story. unusual. Okay, so I'm going to cover something that's a rather unusual and I'm not sure what's, why, what the answer is here. Um, I'll see if I can duplicate this problem. We'll see here. Let me get to this paragraph. Um, I'm going to zoom in just a smidge. Yeah, oh, see I'm trying to duplicate the problem. I'm having a hard time duplicating this problem, but um, what you may have to do, if, if you are clicking on the red plus sign and you don't get a little loaded cursor, what we just did back there, um, hmm, this is odd. Wow. Floating over lines and I'm seeing them until I get to this last one. But we, we ended up clicking on the line, which I, I can't duplicate the issue. Mine's not acting the same way. Oh, well, now it is. Click on that line, then the plus sign. I, yeah, I'm not sure what's going on with uh, a couple of your guys' InDesigns. You should be able to get the load cursor as soon as you click on that red plus sign. If you don't, float over the little line that the type is on and click on that, and then click on the little red plus sign. Then I'm not sure exactly why yours is doing it and mine is not. Now, it is helpful to um, select all that type. And turn on your hidden characters. Go to type, hide, or show hidden characters. Um, that way you know where one paragraph stops and the other one starts. Because it's really difficult when you're doing this crazy, wacky setting to understand where sometimes one paragraph starts and the other one begins. Move this off to my pasteboard. 
So I only have the first two paragraphs set here. I might even grab um, some of these lines and kind of separate them. You know, if you want to make it look like waves, you can offset them just a little bit. It looks like there's three-dimensional kind of waving going on. So they don't have to be directly on top of one another to, for this to work. I'm going to save because my InDesign is acting a little funky. So let's say I have the first two paragraphs in these waves, and maybe all of a sudden these waves turn into a spiral. Ooh, wouldn't that be exciting? Like, like the water is all of a sudden just, the, the plug has been pulled out of the lake, and there's, there's a big giant sinkhole, and all the water is going down into it. You guys seen those videos before, right? Where water, oh, it's just wild. Like a, like a pond or something, just the lake starts to disappear. It's wild. The blue line, if you hit the W key, it'll go away. It's a non-printable line anyway. So, and then hit the W key again. Uh, yeah, sometimes, I'm not sure why mine's only showing up the blue line on one of them. That's why I was saying, I better say my InDesign is acting funny. It should show blue lines on all of them, but it's a non-printable, so it's not, no sweat really. All right, so let's say I wanted a spiral. And most students want to know how to do this. They're like, oh my gosh, I've seen spiral type. It's on page 112, and I love the little spirals on page 112. How do I do that? Well, InDesign, uh, as of today, I don't think it still has a spiral tool. Um, that's one thing they have not added. But InDesign and Adobe Illustrator are both vector. They're both buddies. So what I do if somebody is wanting to type on a spiral is I open Adobe Illustrator, and I draw a spiral there but then I copy and paste it into InDesign because InDesign and Illustrator are both vector. When I copy and paste from Illustrator to InDesign, it still remains editable. I can edit the graphic. So I'm going to have to open Illustrator. This is my first time opening this semester, well, and using it, the most latest release of Illustrator. So I'm looking at this graphic going, hmm, that's interesting. I haven't seen that before. But I'll have to share with you how to even manage spirals in Illustrator because they're kind of complicated. It doesn't just draw the perfect spiral that you want every time. Um, so this, this part of it is uh, new to most people. The default tool is fine, but it won't give us what we want. So I'm going to hit Command N to create a new document. Um, it's a print document. That's fine. It's okay. We're not even going to save this. So we're going to hit OK, and I'm going to show you how to use the Spiral tool in Illustrator and bring it over to InDesign. Um, get my working view here. So the Spiral tool is found behind the Line tool in Illustrator. Now, I did tell you at the beginning of the semester we'll be using a lot of InDesign, but occasionally we'll be using Illustrator and Photoshop. So in this case, we're going to Illustrator and we're choosing uh, the line segment tool, and you come down and you hit, the, you click on the spiral tool. Now, if I start drawing a spiral, it only gives me so many sec segments and so far apart. Okay, so I'm clicking and dragging. What if I wanted more segments? What if I wanted the spiral lines to be tighter? How does that work? Why well, I, I, I'm not let off of my mouse, just so you know. If I use the arrow up key on the keyboard, which is between your numerics and your you know, letters, it, it adds more segments for the arrow up key. If I use arrow down, it takes away segments. Okay, This is while still holding the mouse key down. My mouse, I have not let off of it. Oh, If I want to tighten the spiral, I click on the, I hold down on the command key and start moving the mouse in towards the spiral shape and it tightens the spiral. Okay, so you can tighten the spiral. Holding down the command key and I still have never let off the mouse. The key is don't let off your mouse. My mouse has not been let off. Now, if I let off the command key but not the mouse, I can then use my arrow key to add more segments. So you guys can, between the command and the arrow key, you can um, create tighter and more segments. Okay? Pretty cool stuff. When you're done, you just let off the mouse. But until you're done with what you have, you do not let off the mouse. So it's a little bit of a, it's like learning a 
chord on the piano. You have to you have to keep certain things down, and you have to hold other things. It's just kind of complicated. Now it will remember how the kind of spiral that you drew before, and now the next time I draw a spiral, it will be exactly in the same number of segments and proportionally the space apart. So I can make a bigger spiral. It's just a bigger version of what I have above. Now let's say I wanted this spiral to have type on it in InDesign. Well, I can copy it by going to Edit and Copy. And I go to InDesign. And I can paste it by going to Edit and Paste. And it's still editable. Whoops, I got the wrong tool. It's still editable. I can put type on it. It's still something I can play with. I can even resize it if I want to. If I hold down Shift and Command and click and drag, I can make it a little smaller. So Shift and Command, and then click and drag keeps it in proportion. OK? So now I can tell this to have type on the path, but I have to get my type on path tool which is underneath my type tool, if it's not already up. And I click at the beginning segment of that swirl. I wait till the plus sign pops in there. Now I get my selection tool, which is that black arrow tool. I'm going to go to my previous typeset matter at the end, where there is the red plus sign. And I'm going to reload my cursor and click on that box first. Oh, yes, yeah, select the box first, then you click on the plus sign. I think that's probably what the problem was. If you see the red plus sign and you just try to click on it, it will not load the cursor. Maybe that's the problem we were having. Click on the last line of text to activate the box, then click on the red plus sign. And when you float over the beginning of the uh, swirl, you'll see the chain link. Click on that, and it will flow the text into that um, that particular uh, path. Now the problem with this is that paragraph is, ex is excessively short and I'm trying to put a lot of type into this shape. So it's, doesn't, it's, it doesn't know what to do. It goes, okay, the paragraph's ended. I know there's more of a story here, but I just don't know what to do. So sometimes I have to, in this case, I'm getting my type tool. I'm going to delete the ending paragraph mark, this is why sometimes I have my invisibles or hidden characters turned on. So I know where that what's happening here. So I'm going to delete that mark and my new paragraph comes in. So I might just use the spacebar to indicate where that paragraph stops and starts. And of course I'm going to turn the line actually off and let the paragraph let the type make that line. I don't like the underlining doesn't look good. Now, I might move this up so it appears as if it is, and I might rotate it, it appears as if it's kind of spinning off of um, this previous line of type. This probably is too big of a swirl. I don't want, now I'm like, oh, my swirl's too big. If I try to reduce it, um, the text might get reduced too, and I might have some problems. So I need to reevaluate my swirl. And it's, my swirl's too big. It's going off the page. And in this case, we definitely want the, the text to be readable. So a lot of people ask me, how did they do what, what they have on that example on page 112? Like, well, they didn't use InDesign completely. They used a combination of InDesign and Illustrator, because Illustrator does the uh, spirals really well. When we have a question. Maybe you missed it. How did you get rid of the actual spiral? Uh, the actual black line on yes. the spiral? Well, as long as the spiral is selected, I went up to the control panel, and it usually has some, you know, weight on its uh, stroke weight, like a 1 or 0.85 or whatever. I just go to 0, and it turns that off. Okay? Yep. So I have right now uh, four paragraphs indicated on this uh, funky design <coughs> here. Um, the, yeah, bless you. First paragraph, second paragraph, here's my third paragraph, which I need to try to get to fit a little bit better on the page. Um, and then my fourth paragraph has started in here, but it's not completely.
completed. So I definitely my spiral is not the right size or proportion. Um, so I I could sit there and play with this and continue with my fifth paragraph. Uh, maybe my fifth paragraph is just in a box. So I'm going to pretend that's the end of my fourth paragraph. But I click on the little red plus sign, and I'm just going to draw a box here. And I would have to definitely watch my flow, but this is perhaps my last paragraph. Oh, I got a couple of paragraphs there. Don't want it too long, but so I'm like, well, that is some really funky set typography. I'm not sure how many people would take the time to read it, but it is funky. So it's a way to indicate where possibly one paragraph starts and stops. Where I've messed up though is right here. I have a partial paragraph here, which needs to be in his own place. So I have to find that paragraph and make him his own. And that was a fairly long paragraph. So that's, that's going to be a bit of a challenge, but I can do it. It's just going to take me time. So right now, for me, I have explored uh, something not too exciting, which was make the first word bold and red. The second one was um, separate them out in different boxes, but yet they still maintain a link to one another. So they flow. If I increase the size of a box, it's going to flow from one paragraph to the next. Um, then the next one was, hey, I put type on paths. I create a wavy path and I create a spiral path. Most of the paths I can create in InDesign, uh, but the spiral is something I have to do in Illustrator. Now, I suppose if you wanted a square spiral, you don't have to do that in Illustrator. If you wanted a square spiral path, you use your pen tool in InDesign. And let's say, and I'm going to hold down my shift key so everything stays nice and straight when I draw. So I can sit here and I can manually draw by holding down the shift key again, this spiral that is square. So if you wanted to have something on a square spiral, you can do a square spiral pretty easily. Uh, Illustrator doesn't have a square spiral. You basically have to do the same thing I'm doing right here. So again, I'm holding on the shift key. It keeps everything kind of nice and sharp here. If you don't, uh, you know, if you want them tighter, then let off the shift key. But, you know, I might even start getting kind of crazy with it. Woo! That looks horrible. But as soon as I copy and paste, I'm going to go to my previous area here. Select all my text. And I've copied it. But I have to turn this into a type on path. Uh, sort of thing because it's not yet. So make sure I grab my type on path tool and click on that that square spiral and I paste it in there. Oops, I didn't grab the whole story. Excuse me. Let me grab the whole story. It will spiral all by itself till the end and let me turn off the stroke weight. And that is kind of interesting to look at. And I'm just simply uh, using the same thing I did as above, where I have a bold first word and red for each paragraph. So that became somewhat interesting. The last thing I want to show you that, uh, you know, the other things in the book are just separate text boxes and different, you know, like one paragraph's bold, the next one's, next one's ultra bold. So that it's just where you're positioning the text boxes. But in this case, I would like to share with you special shapes. Um, the book has a, a hexagon shape that they put type in. Um, so I'm going to first show you how to do that, even though it's in the book and that's not necessarily what I'm looking for. I want to at least show you how they did that. So I'm going to choose the rectangle tool. And if I hold down on the mouse on the rectangle tool, I'll have the ellipse tool and the polygon tool that are options. Ellipse make ovals and circles, and polygons make multi-sided multi objects that are that have good symmetry, perfect symmetry. Now, if I double after I choose the polygon tool, if I double click on it before I, I don't even click on my layout yet. If I double click on the actual polygon tool, I can tell it how many sides I want. So, if you wanted, um, you know, a ten-sided polygon, you hit ten, and when it draws, it'll create a ten-sided polygon. Now, when you're drawing, if you hold down the shift key, it will keep it in perfect proportion. Otherwise, it draws it out of proportion. So hold down your shift key for perfect proportioned objects. 
So there's a 10 sided polygon. Maybe I want, let me deselect him. I'm going to double click on this tool again, and maybe I want an 8 sided poly octagon. So I hold down the shift key while I'm holding, and that's the stop sign shape. So I'm, these, these aren't nearly as going to be as pretty. Um, again, I'm going to deselect my stop sign shape, double click on my polygon tool, maybe I want a five sided one. So I'm creating all these different shapes. I might even throw a circle in there. Now the, this again is not going to be very pretty. If I hold down the shift key while I'm holding my circle down, uh, while I'm, while I'm uh, holding my mouse down, it will create a perfect circle. So these are all shapes. Now let's put some type in these shapes. I will eventually turn off the uh, stroke on these, but right now I need to see them. So I'm going to select all of my story. Um, so I'm going to my first one, select all, copy it. And I'm going to go back down here. And the cool thing is there's no type in shape tool. When I have my, my type tool selected, it knows that if I'm floating over a shape, that if I click inside of it, I can then paste that type. When I switch up and use my selection tool and this text box is selected, you'll see the red plus sign. I have to click on that to get my cursor loaded and then I click on the next one. So I can link these all up. Now, these need to probably be separated by paragraph. So if that's the case, I'm not holding down, I could hold my shift key down and I'm going to readjust the size of my polygon. I may have to I may have to hit the return key to get the paragraph for Monarch to the next um, polygon too. You got to this. This one's a little tougher. I'm trying to get these paragraphs to fit in there. But again, if I hold down my Shift key while I am resizing my polygon, it will hopefully squeeze out maybe some of the text. And if not, I might have to hit the return key to get that to me the next line. Because in this case, I copied and pasted text that didn't have like paragraph separated. Now there are some unfortunate circumstances that do come up whenever we are using polygons and whenever we have a, a more acute angles. Those unfortunate circumstances are situations like this where it puts extra space between your first uh, word and your second word. If I hit the delete key, I don't want these to be one word, so that was just the space bar there. What's happened is February is a too long of a word to fit up here in this space. Oh, that bites. So sometimes when you're trying these kinds of things, certain shapes work better than others. Shapes where um, they're even numbers, they have a flat uh, polygon, they have a thing that's at the zero degree angle, so this is flat. Well, this one is an odd number, so it's got a point. Now, I suppose we could rotate it and you'd have the flat side up top. But when we rotate it, it doesn't know that the text isn't supposed to rotate. So this is this gets really problematic if we're using these basic shapes. But that's not that's got two paragraphs in there anyway. So I'm going to hold down the shift key. And I'm going to squeeze out. Well, let me put the return. Let me hit the return so that I can move that next paragraph to the next line. But if I hold down the shift key, I can keep my shape proportional. And uh, if I hold on my mouse and start dragging, I can actually see this live. There we go, that looks pretty good, except for February, it just doesn't look right like that. And then I have this paragraph. And I have more than more paragraphs, but just to show you what they've done with the type inside of a shape, they've kind of done it this way. And they certainly did justify the type. It's not flush left, rag, rag right. When you do flush left, ragged right, it looks really bad. So here is flush left, rag right, that looks horrible, especially if we turn off the stroke. That doesn't look very well organized. Whereas if we make it justified, get my, let me get my type selection tool, justified, it does contour those shapes a little bit better. <clears throat> now we can also analyze which shapes work better. Uh, the six-sided uh, polygon, worked really well in the example in the book, whereas a 10-sided looks like it's a circle. The 8-sided, you can't really tell that's, that's a stop sign shape. 
And the five-sided gives us problems because the words might be too long to get to that second line. So the hexagon shape is probably, uh, it probably they chose that for a reason, I'm guessing, because it works well with, with the, the way type functions. And you can do special shapes. Like, let's say you're pretty good with the pen tool. Um, let's say I have uh, an hourglass shape, and I'm talking about um, time. And this hourglass shape uh, is going to contain this text. I'm going to reduce this down a little bit, copy and paste it. So I, don't want to, I only want to draw half of my hourglass, and I'm going to copy and paste, flip, and, and get these two to come together. flip it. There's a flipper in InDesign. It's really nice. It's just a little flip tool. And I'm going to join these segments. This is, a, this is a little advanced, but if you want me to join those open segments, and then there's an opening segment and closing segment down here that I need to join, assuming they didn't join. But again, they might have. Let me see if they're joined. Oh, nope, they're not joined. If they're broken. This won't work. Object paths join. So this is one, con one continual shape. Now I'm going to copy all my text, and I can paste it inside of this shape. But it doesn't know which way to go because I had used my flipper. Oops, I'm going to flip that the other way. It's right reading now. So I might even reduce the size of this text a little bit so it will fit ni more nicely in here. Might change the letting amount just a smidge, let's say 10 over 12. There we go. And it is justified, but we have some beginning and ending paragraph things. So I might, I might have to take out the uh, return between paragraphs. Because as soon as I put this on zero, it's not real easy to tell that's an hourglass shape. So in this case, I may have to just indicate my paragraph start and stop by what I did initially, which is the red letters. So this looks a lot better. This functions better. Let me increase the size of that just a little bit. So this is a custom shape. I need a little extra type in there to accommodate for that line. So I'm going to just, I can reduce the size of this. Let's see if I can squeeze that in there. There we go. So I just created a custom shape and put type in there. Now, not all shapes work real well. Uh, let me create a shape that does not work well for this. Um, I'm going to draw a horse, and it's going to look really horrible, okay? I'll, I'll just warn you. This is going to look horrible. There's his back end. Here's his front end. Here's his hee -hee -hee -hee. Here's his mane. He is sexy. I know. My horse is the best. Here's his little front hair. Here's his nose. Hee -hee -hee -hee. Here's his little chin parts. Here's his neck. Here's his little running feet. I like to make noises when I draw stuff. I'm sorry. <laughs> it's just fun. It makes my job fun. I do this by myself, too. It doesn't take a crowd to... When you guys come by my office, sometimes you'll hear me talking and there's nobody in there. Don't worry. I'm okay. Uh, I think that one goes down this way. Oh, my. Poor horse. <laughs> Told you it was going to be bad. Okay, and then let's make his tail. I'm not as good with the pen tools as I think I am. I, I am. I just am taking no time at all on this. Yeah, you guys try to draw a horse with a pen tool. Oh, and he's missing a leg, but that's okay. He's a three-legged horse, folks. Nee hey hey. All right. So I have this horse shape. Let me make him a little bit bigger. And I'm going to put some copy in him. You're like, oh, that's going to be awesome. I know. It is. Wait. So let me copy all this text that I have. And I'm going to put my cursor in my nehe -he and I'm going to paste my text. No. Because as soon as I turn off this thing, it doesn't look nothing like a horse at all. Anything that you have to skip over stuff, like you got to skip from one leg to the other and read. You got to skip from this tail. It's a, see, what I'm going to read is monarch butterfly one year. It's a monarch butterfly. <laughs> Aren't you going to read that like that? 
what it's supposed to be is monarch butterflies go through four stages and blah, blah, blah. In one year, it's a little confusing, but blah, blah, blah. And then, uh, oh my God, I'm getting lost. The four, I think it's the four stages of the monarch butterfly life cycle are the egg, the larva, and the adult butterfly. Oh my God, you get lost. You can't break across like this. It will drive people nuts and they, they don't read like that. They read in little, it's called chunky. We read in chunks. So shapes where you have things that break across, like legs, the tail part, you people get lost. It's like, I don't know what you're trying to do here, but you're trying you're messing with my reading. So these shapes don't work well. Messing with my reading. So this is a no-go right here. No go. Whereas this, because nothing broke across. There's no breaks there. It's one continuous flowing thing. That worked out just fine. That's a yay-yay. And that's a nay-nay. All right, that's a no. So um, you can do all sorts of custom shapes. You just got to be careful about what kind of shape you're putting type in. That's for sure. This one just does not work. All right, what other question, or what questions do you now have that, since I've shown you all of this crazy stuff, and don't worry, I did videotape it because it is, I, went, I know I go fast. Um, but what kind of crazy questions might you have about all this crazy stuff? Did I lose everybody? I knew it. I knew I would. That's why I record these videos. Okay, so what I'm going to do is um, I'm going to stop the video, and we're going to take a break. Hopefully, it's, hopefully it recorded. Let's find out. It didn't.